Hi, welcome back. In this lesson, let's look at how Lambda functions work under the hood. This is not necessary for making good use of Lambda functions, but it's something that I think many of you would enjoy learning about. First of all, your code runs inside Firecracker, which is an open source micro VM technology developed by AWS, and it underpins both Lambda and Fargate. So no, Lambda doesn't run on containers which is why AWS is able to optimize Lambda's code start performance much more so than Azure functions and the Google Cloud functions. You can invoke your functions through the AWS CLI or AWS SDKs or by configuring an event trigger, but ultimately they all use Lambda's invoke API, which lets you invoke a function either synchronously or asynchronously by setting the invocation type in the request to either request response or event respectively. Some event triggers like API Gateway and ALB would invoke the function synchronously with request and the response, while others like SNS, EventBridge and S3 would invoke the function asynchronously, which ultimately means the event is pushed onto an internal event queue and the Lambda service just respond with a success and then the event will be picked up and processed by the intended function code. So let's look at what happens under the hood when the Lambda service receives a synchronous invoke request. The request is received by the front-end application load balancer, which distributes traffic across three availability zones to a stateless front-end invoke service, which performs authentication and authorization and calls the counting service which enforces things like the account concurrency limit or the reserve concurrency setting on the function to make sure you're not exceeding any throughput limits. The front end then calls the assignment service, which is a stateful service and is responsible for routing requests to a fleet of worker hosts, which are the servers that runs your code and is responsible for downloading and running your code inside Firecracker micro VMs. If your function code has not been loaded on any of the worker hosts, or if all the worker hosts running your code are currently busy handling other requests, then the assignment service needs to create a new execution environment to handle this invoke request. And this is what we call a code start. So in this case, the assignment service calls the placement service to create a new execution environment on one of the worker hosts and the placement service uses machine learning to determine which worker host to use, and the assignment service would start the initialization process on the execution environment, which downloads your code, runs initialization, and the exact steps for initialization differs by runtime, but once the execution environment is ready, the front-end invoke service sends the invoke payload to the execution environment, which then calls your function handler and sends its response back to the original caller. The worker then informs the assignment service that is now ready to receive the next request. So when a subsequent invoke request comes in, the assignment service knows that our previous execution environment is now warm and ready. It tells the front end and the front end then sends the invocation payload to this worker host right away without having to create a new execution environment. So existing execution environments are reused wherever possible. And so that was synchronous invocations. What about asynchronous or event invocations? Architecturally, there are a lot of similarities. The async invocation request is still going to the same front-end load balancer, which sees that this is an async invocation. So it forwards the request to an event invoke front-end service instead of the front-end invoke service. I don't know why they named them like that, but what's important is that these are separate internal services in order to give you better resilience and scalability by insulating the workloads from each other. The event invoke front-end service then puts the event payload onto an internal SQS queue and respond to the caller right away because async invocations are fine and forget from the caller's perspective so they don't have to wait for the invocation to complete. And it's worth noting that the Lambda service actually scales up and down the number of queues based on throughput. And all of that is managed internally, so it's not something that you need to worry about. SQS is a polling-based service, so the Lambda service runs a cluster of pollers that post messages 
off the queue and the synchronously invoke your function using the front end invoke service we looked at earlier. So yep, all Lambda invocations are ultimately synchronous and the same synchronous execution flow would happen again behind the scenes, except the caller in this case is one of the SQS polars. If the invocation is successful, then the polar would delete the messages from the SQS queue. Otherwise, the message will be retried. And if you have any Lambda destination set up, then the polar would also be responsible for forwarding the success or failure payload to your destination. And what's funny is that for a long time, Lambda didn't actually support SQS as an event source, even though they have this whole polling infrastructure internally for async invocations. And so the whole event source mappings mechanism is born, which uses the same polling architecture to read messages from event sources that require polling. And it works with Kinesis and the DynamoDB streams, SQS, Amazon Managed Streaming for Kafka or MSK, Amazon MQ, and even your self-hosted Kafka streams. There is a corresponding CloudFormation resource that lets you configure the behavior of these polars, like batch size, filters, starting position, etc. Many of these settings are event source specific. And when you're using the likes of Service Framework or CDK to configure these event triggers, your settings would ultimately be compiled to this event source mapping resource in cloud formation. And like with async invocations, these polars invoke your functions through the front end invoke service using synchronous invocations. And the Lambda service manages the state of these polars and can send failed payloads to a failure destination. But it's worth noting that this whole failure destination mechanism doesn't work for SQS event sources where you still have to use your own redrive policy on the SQS queue to capture failed events. And the great thing is that you don't pay for this polling layer and you don't have to bear the complexity of building and running these polars, making Lambda the simplest and probably the most cost efficient way to process events from these event sources. The information I presented here is accurate as of the end of 2022 because the source from Julian Wood's excellent talk at reInvent 2022 and I haven't seen a follow-up session in 2023, so I assume the information here is still accurate. But of course, I don't work for AWS, so I don't really have a way to verify this information and how up-to-date it is. And if you want to learn more about Lambda internals, then you should check out this talk on YouTube. It goes into a lot more details about other aspects of the Lambda service, which I've omitted to focus on what's important from the perspective of this workshop. Okay, I'll see you in the next lesson. Hi, I hope you have enjoyed this video. And if you do, why not check out these other videos and learn more about serverless development?